Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> My name is Yoon Jin. Um, I'm a co-founder of a startup called The Life Site in Silicon Valley. And um, I am very honored to be you know, standing here and give a lecture. And today I'm going to cover the story about entrepreneurship between South Korea and Asia and, and between Asia and Silicon Valley. And my personal experience being an entre entrepreneur and also as an investor. So what is this globe, right? Earth. Um, when I was really little, when I was young, I always had this idea that I wanted to be a global person. My mom bought me a glove and I was looking at all the continents in the glove and I was thinking, I live in this tiny country, but what's out there? So my story, everything started from this curiosity that what's the world out there? And um, I started to execute on my dream. So first execution was learning English and second, was I actually asked my parents that when I was four, 13 that I want to go U.S. by myself and learn about culture and learn about the diversity. So my father, who works at government, he's a military man, and he found a government program from U.S. And I took the test. I got accepted. So I went high school in Evanston, Illinois uh, for sophomore and junior year. And I learned that there are more people out there who have different culture, different values, but we can find a way to coordinate. Because when I first moved there and studied at high school, I was the only Korean. And actually, I got bullied because I didn't speak English as much as they do. And um, also, I wore differently. I speak differently, right? So they just started to bully me. And I was trying to figure out why they see the difference and they see distance on me. And, and I started to understand they are just different. And if I want to get to know them, I should understand their difference, like their, their culture, what they eat, how they hang out. So I started to adapt to the culture that I found out myself that I can survive here. So all the, you know, my journey started from my high school year that I was confident that I can come here and do anything. After a high school year, after college year, I've done a lot of work besides TV. I've done a lot of industry work, fashion, oil business. And I was involved with so many other um, government ambassador work after I became Miss Korea Sun. So I was crowned to be 2010 Miss Korea Sun. I was titled and I was able to travel all around the world and uh, was able to connect with all the people, uh, including politicians, um, business people, and um, like TV, entertainment people, all different types of people. And the reason I went to pageant is actually when I was working as an intern journalist at Korea Times, I was interviewing a lot of Korean American and I realized that pageant can be another platform to execute and let people know about Korea. And at that time, um, a lot of people actually talked about Honey Lee and who was fourth place of the uh, uh, Miss Universe. And I realized that, she, that people pay attention, even though she, she was, you know, she was just Miss Korea maybe, but she was actually representing to culture that people pay attention to her through her beauty, that I wanted to use the Miss Korea platform to go global. And I shared my vision and my dream with the judges. And even though I was the oldest Miss Korea, you know, I was actually, um, when I actually uh, run, went for the uh, pageant, a lot of judges like, you are way too old for your age um, for, to go on a pageant because most girls who run for a pageant are 19, but I was 24. I already had a working experience. And they were like, how, 
like, how did you even come up with the idea you can run for pageant when you're 24? Then, and I, I told um, judges that, but I have a different vision. They might come here to show the beauty, but I want to use this platform to let people know about Korea. And I was right. And through the Miss Korea um, experience, I was able to connect all different types of people around the world, China, US, Japan, everywhere. And then one day, I got a phone call. And it was from David Lee, who was my former partner at K-Startup, which was first startup accelerator in Korea. And he sent me a random email and a random call all of a sudden. And the first thing I answered to him was like, how did you even find me? And why do you want to work with me? And I, I wasn't sure how he even, you know, he even came up with the idea that, you know, he wanted to work with me when, while I was working at TV station. Uh, I had my own show at the time. I was having a glamorous time of my life. And when he asked me, I, I was like, okay, so what do they going to, what, what do they do and what are their mission? And K Startup's mission was um, to help Korean entrepreneurs uh, make their business grow and go global, which aligns with my own mission and my vision of my life. So when I talked to my um, partners, KJ and David Lee, we started the first startup accelerator in Korea. It was the first time in Korea that we had no idea how to, you know, really properly run the accelerator. So first thing we started was we brought entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And there were um, young entrepreneurs, MIT graduated, uh, funded by Sequoia Capital, um, and all those like really famous angel investor, including David, um, that they were sharing their story, how it was difficult for them to start the company from the garage. And then, you know, every time they want to focus on product, but they have to do the fundraising at the same time that, you know, they want to share the story to Korean startup that Korean startup can come to US and start their business. And I happened to get to really close to my mentor pool and we became really close friends that whenever I had doubt about myself, about um, being in tech world, um, when I'm not engineer, they were encouraging me that Yunjin, you'll be the next Jessica Livington, who is a YC partner, um, um, Paul Grimm's wife, that don't worry, because your talent is actually, uh, will help a lot of Korean entrepreneurs um, to go, go global. So K Startup, we invested 40K, and we were the first Asian Google partner in Asia that, um, I was exposed to a lot of VCs and business people in Silicon Valley, including Professor Dasher. Um, and I helped and managed all those 40 startups. I was, I had no weekend, you know, I was literally chatting with all the founders, including designer and engineers. We came up with the idea with the product and everything. So I learned like a dog, <laughs> dog ears, you know. Um, I was participating there um, early stage of their startup and I was really fascinated and I met and brought so many good Silicon Valley entrepreneurs including my current co-founder Chris Wong and brought them to Korea to mentor my startups that what is the core difference between Silicon Valley and Korea and we did actually get a pretty good track record as K startup um, so 70 to 80% of our portfolio, um, we got additional funding, which is really hard when you look at the statistics. So this is a um, statistics from 2016. And if you look at this graph, um, you see there's an abundant money towards the seed round and pre-seed round. It's because when we first started the company 
and accelerator, 2013 was the peak time that the government, Korean government wanted to boost the ecosystem of startup that they start putting $1 million every year to boost the ecosystem. And so we had a, a lot of you know, money towards the uh, seed round. But the difficulty and the limitation that I have actually faced helping Korean entrepreneur was actually um, after the acceleration time. So if you look at this, um, from Series A to exit, there's you know, dramatically dropped funding. So, which means like there is a limited um, ecosystem for Series A funding round. And what's worse about Korean actually ecosystem was there's no exit. It's it's almost zero. And it really um, was actually hard for me. Even I was not an entrepreneur. I was helping them because they look for you know their growth. They want to be next Steve job. They want to be next Samsung. But they also know that there's a limitation that they can grow or they can sell the company. And so if you look at this, this is a number of startup in 2015 that after two to three years, number of startup dramatically drop. They can't sustain their business because they cannot get funded and also because of these reasons. So I, I analyzed this and the first biggest obstacle for Korean startup to grow was the market opportunity or in market market size that they're facing. Maybe the market size itself is you know big enough because Coupang is now more than $5 billion company. There's Yellow Mobile, there's Pedari Minjok. There are a couple of billion, I mean five of them like uh, as a billion dollar unicorn company. But the thing is, if they're not the first leader of the market, and they're not the first, um, they're not Samsung or they're not LG, then there's no acquisition or there's no exit that most of them, just, they just die. Um, I actually, when I was working at the K startup, I was interviewing and actually just went to all the you know successful founders that ask help. What's what is your secret source to be successful as a Korean startup? And one of them was the Pedara Minjuk, um, which is a first delivery service and now is a unicorn company um, that Kim Bong Jin Deputy actually um, told me that the reason he was able to dominate the market was he was the first. So if you were the second then you have to spend tons of money to acquire users. And um, also, it's almost impossible to compete with the market leader that it's, I would actually not encourage other startups to go into the same industry when there's a market leader and dominate the market. That's what he said. Um, so I was devastated to hear that, but at the same time, it kind of gives me hope and then also encouragement that K Startup is helping them to not just focus on Korean market, but to go global. So, which means, you know, all this lack of, you know, market opportunity or lack of exit, um, Korean startups still have an opportunity, and hope to go big through a global market. Also, um, there was a challenge for a lot of um, startups after seed round. Um, after one or two years, a lot of them they um, they doubt about themselves because there's a you know lack of funding, and also um, the families and friends they are not really supported in terms of culture. And Korea people, we like brand, we like names. We like Samsung, we like LG, I, I'm a doctor, I work at Samsung. That's actually kind of like the um, uh, status of who you are, which is not always true, but like, you know, um, it's changing definitely, but it has been. 
because um, our economy from Korean War War uh, Korean War we we dramatically grew from all those companies effort like Hyundai's and Samsung and they hired smart people and then we work days and nights to you know grow our economy and we became one of the top GDP um, country um, that people fear to start the startup and people fear to sustain their business when there's you know there's there's more actually percentage to you know fail I mean it's the same thing in Silicon Valley but it's at least in Silicon Valley, there is like a lot of acquisition, like Google acquire and um, Facebook acquire. And you hear all those stories, but Korea is not. So I had to encourage Korean startups, my entrepreneurs, especially when they get married and child, they really fear. They couldn't sleep, and every time they fundraise, they just have nervous attack. I want. I have to make sure that. What they're following is very, spe you know, the, the following the dream is very special, and and you're not the only person who's going through. So, one of the thing I was actually really focusing was um, I make the startups, K startups, um, startups as a family that they support each other. The founder to pull. You're not the only one who's going through this. Let me help you with my engineer. Let me help you with my designer. That was the focus that I had to do when I was running the accelerator. And actually, it worked because, um, for example, there's a company called the Miso, and they were the third um, Korean startup who got accepted by YC recently. And the Miso actually started from the company called Chin Chin, and it was a dating application. And they failed because there was already, you know, a dominant market leader as a dating application. So they failed, but they merged with another startup in K startup. And then they recreate a really good engineering team and really good team. And they create a team called Miso. And then they apply for YC and they got accepted and they got funded and they're, you know, generating lots of revenue right now. So that was the thing I... I I was learning through um, K startup. So, and also I brought a lot of startups to Silicon Valley to get investment. Um, and I also taught them how to pitch in front of investors, especially in English. And because uh, product matters, but product is not the one that only matters. Like you need to know how to sell it to customer, to investors. So I actually happen to know how to speak in front of public. Hopefully I'm doing well <laughs> right now. Um, that I actually, you know, tutor my entrepreneurs every Friday. And um, luckily most of them, they won all the competition and they got funded or they got grants. And I, you know, research and went everywhere in the world, like Singapore, Hong Kong, US, New York, Silicon Valley, to research what's out there. So, and I made a partnership, with, sort of like a partnership with Y Combinator for the first time that they were able to, the startups from Korea, they were able to get mentor from people like Michael Siebel that you see on the picture. He sold uh, um, Twitch for $1 billion to Yahoo that, you know, the Korean startup, they they can get inspired and they can see what's different uh, with Silicon Valley and, you know, Asia and Korean market. But it was not good enough. You know, bring all those people and giving some recipes of, you know, or sorcery of the success. It was not good enough for me to, you know, understand everything, help those entrepreneurs. And I share this hunger with my current co-founder, Chris Wong, who's sitting over there. And initially, we were actually going to start our own fund and help those Korean entrepreneurs and bring to U.S. because he has network. I know the market in Asia. I have the network. So we were very confident that we could help those people that we were actually going to start the fund. But then one day, it's another one phone call. Yes that he called me and 
Yunjin, I'm sending you a pitch deck. And I was like, what is it? And it was about LifeSight. So LifeSight, what we do is um, this little safety deposit box. We manage and store all the life important documents and information in your life. And it's easily shared with your family members, advisor, anyone you trust. I'm pretty sure all the audience here, they have their own personal story, how to handle, how difficult it is to actually share all the, you know, your medical information or your, you know, even grandma's recipe with your family member who live far from, from, from here, like, you know, like maybe from East Coast or other country. And when I saw this idea, it just hit me like, okay, this is something that I'm personally able to um, relate to. And um, it was related to security, which I always want to learn. And this is going to be US company that if I know how to execute, you know, all this high technology, including cloud security, you know, and I knew that this company, it, this idea is not just focused on the US and also it will be, it will go to global to anywhere there's especially a disaster like Indonesia or Japan that this was perfect platform for me to go another step to go global so i told chris that you know what i'll do it so i left everything i had built and family member everything and then start my own company in our own living room. My living room, yes. It was very difficult. Um, no, it was in, it's here. Yeah, so I came here by myself and we started our own company and built all the IKEA furniture. I did not get pay and I was the only foreign founder. All my teams are, you know, non-Korean. Um, I thought I was pretty good at adapting to culture, and you know, my English is not too bad. That I thought it would have been, you know, not too difficult, but I made a mistake. <laughs> it was very difficult, and my team also had to go through um, some of the difference um, that I have uh, as personality-wise or culture-wise, um, they sometimes, you know, call me that, told me that I do K-Rage. <laughs> so I, I'm so used to it, everything, you know, doing fast, 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 that um, my team member, they sometimes drag the conference, like, you know, or um, meeting a lot, and it kind of frustrated, and I yell at them, and they just like, oh, you're doing K-Rage. <laughs> so all those things were learning journey and now we have um, three products um, we have consumer product and enterprise software enterprise product that we're generating revenue and we raise five million dollars for seed round and we're raising I think I don't know I can say that yeah we just raised three million dollars almost yeah this um, and a lot of people ask me, how did you do it as a Korean entrepreneur? Because more than I think 99% of the Korean entrepreneur who start the company here, they fail, most of them. Unless they're Korean American or they know culture very well. But my power was my team. So I have very diverse um, team with different age, different race, different background. I have more team actually. I have 20 employees right now. We have Indian people, <laughs> we have Caucasian, we have Chinese. I'm the only Korean and I'm the only actually, uh, actually I'm, I became, there's a second one who actually moved from India. So I'm no longer only foreigner in our company, but um, from all the journey lesson that I had from my startup and and try to figure out why Korean startup were not able to execute well in the United States was actually the cooperation and teamwork. 
I did not know until I came here that how important it is actually, because Korea is very hierarchy, you know, society. It is good and bad because we execute very fast because the order it comes from up from down that you have to you do your work no matter what then you know maybe there's no time for creativity but you 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 still do your work that there's result but including my company silicon valley companies are usually flat flat culture so even though I'm a co-founder and I have my partner, co-founder as CEO, we never have any issue with, oh, you just have to follow what I said. We discuss. And when we discuss and we, when we respect the difference, we actually come up with a very unique and special idea that all led to our business and that all led to our product. For example, there's a function called, I mean, there's a product called a plus, which, um, which is uh, focusing on the family members to share all this information. And we did have that idea, but I, when I went back to Korea, I was back and forth for a while. Um, and I was working on some of the paper with my visa lawyer um, immigration process that I had to exchange really crucial document with my lawyer when I was in Korea and there was no secure tool to share. And she didn't know how to set up the safe, um, secure mail software. And so she I, she was like, Yunjin, can you just send me all the passport, all your credentials through email, which is like dangerous. And as much as I learn about security, oh, you know what, I can't give you, you know, through email. So why don't you just come to my life site? And when I came back to uh, my team and share my experience that there's got to be a lot of families out there that they, when they travel and when they are outside of the U.S. or, you know, they have to find a way to share all this important information and document easily and safely. So I share the experience and my team respected that and it turned out to be product and then actually people see the value the most because it came from the personal you know experience and and I'm very thankful that they actually value my experience and even though I was you know not engineering background I'm not an engineer who codes right but they still respect my opinion as a business person as a co-founder that I was able to you know, even charge of some of the features and product and, you know, and I was very happy to see my idea turning into product and I was able to sell it. So I really do believe that the power of Silicon Valley is all cooperation. Cooperation between team member, cooperation between entrepreneur and VC or any other organization. Um, like government organization, it's all cooperation and people matter. People are the one that who's going to give you opportunity and people are going to be the one that who's going to execute your dream. You, are, you cannot do it by yourself. But when I look at a lot of Korean startups who come to Silicon Valley and try to get the advice from me, I see the limitation. This is my personal opinion, but... Uh, first is they're not ready to accept the new culture. If you are in Rome, you got to follow the Rome's you know, rule, right? Um, but we Koreans, we've been invaded by so many countries over the time that we're very much very protected, that we're not open to accept other culture that when they do a business, especially globally, it became a huge obstacle. Because when you run your business in a different country, you need to know the regulations, you need to know how people think, you need to know the culture to approach the customer, right? But we stick with our own Korean stigma that we run our company in a Korean way and only talking to Korean people that you don't really get funded, funding, and also you don't attract customer who 
are not Korean. So that was one of the things I realized that it's, it's the biggest hurdle and actually biggest challenge and difficulty of Korean startups to go global. And of course, language matter, but um, especially it's the, as an executive level, you need to you know, communicate with other people to understand what they need and you need to negotiate, right? So that's also the one of the biggest obstacle. And also um, uh, funding, like a lot of startups when I brought them from Korea to Silicon Valley, uh, even though there's some traction, even though they're, you know, they're getting well known, it still was difficult to get funded because a lot of VCs, they want to invest what they're comfortable about, which meaning they want to invest company within US, they can help and they can take care of and they, they can give you know strategies and advice. But if the company actually start from the Korea side, then a lot of investor, I don't know about Korean market, so it's no thank you, please. That's, I've experienced a lot with my Korean startups. So um, if I s bring all my team from Korea, I would actually um, suggest investor that um, like we were open to accept any advice from investor here that that's why we need those investor to be a strategic partner because investment is not just about money, it's about strategy. You get all the network and you get the strategy from investment investment so that you can scale. So, um, so I would say those kind of things to uh, investor. But it would be still hard, but I think a lot of Korean startup, they focus on, I do this, I do this, my product's this, without telling how they're gonna grow and how they're gonna do the business in the United States. So um, that's why I put the product fit because, um, and also the business skill, they, they only f you know, um, focus on their own stigma, as I said, that they don't change the product. Let's say, for example, design. Korean product design is much more detail-wise unlike US. If you, do you guys know Kakao Talk? Um, if you compare Kakao Talk with the WhatsApp, the design is whole different. WhatsApp is so simple, unlike Kakao Talk. Kakao Talk is basically there's everything there. But if actually they bring Kakao Talk to US, were they able to success? I don't think so because the design fit, the product fit, doesn't really fit for American culture. So when you come to different market, your product has to be changed too for the people who are actually living in the area that you are selling. And also, you need to know how to approach, approach the people who you're selling. That means you need network. That's actually involved with the investment side because investor will give you the network. Investor will you know, guide you to um, you know, some of the strategic partners that if you cannot do it, they can help you. So, but what you need to do is like, you need to be charming to and open-minded to approach those people and let them know how much you're passionate so, so that, you know, um, they can help you. But a lot of startups, they're scared or um, maybe they're not comfortable with their language that they, they actually don't even ask and they just keep building and building in their garage or their living room. Or, um, and then they keep you know, only chatting with the Korean people. But if you want to scale in this different country, talk to people out there. You know? Doesn't matter their different race, doesn't matter where they come from. They're all your customer, they're all your investor. You never know. So reach out to people and talk to those people and listen and and think and whether it has to be completely changed and you still need to keep your own values and combine those you know advice or listening this is one statistics that i 
I got it when I was researching. This is how, <laughs> I don't want to say bad, but bad <laughs> Korean startups um, in terms of a respecting diversity. I don't blame it because we've been invaded so many times and I sometimes have that um, attitude that it is difficult for me to completely open and accept a different culture or accept a different, you know, races. But I was, you know, able to figure out how to be flexible. But a lot of Koreans, they are educated to stick with one blood. We call it 한일민족, 한일민족, 단일민족, sorry. Um, that we have to st stick with one blood so that we we're able to, you know, fight all the people that who are invading, right? So it makes sense that um, we we actually have hard time accepting international uh, employees or international business people to actually get close to um, us, and that is a big, big, big obstacle for a Korean startup to scale. I do think so. Um, Next one is, um, you know what it is, yeah? Who he is, she is, um, one Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, I want to talk about my experience as a female entrepreneur and female career woman. I speak at a lot of conferences actually about how difficult and what kind of attitude I should or we, women should have or other people have. Um, simply put, being a career female woman, uh, I mean, um, career woman, is constant challenge. It's so difficult, especially in Asia uh, and Korea. Um, we, are, we are, they are still in, still in male dominant um, society. Um, I would say it's changing definitely. Uh, but when I was working as especially uh, in tech world, uh, there most of the times whenever I went to a meeting, I was the only female investor when youngest. And sometimes they even, you know, stopped me talking or they didn't even, you know, pay attention to me or they didn't even say hi because I'm a woman. And it was very difficult Honestly, it became some sort of personal uh, attack that is it me that because I carry, you know, Miss Korea title or is it me that I didn't study uh, engineering? But I realized that actually it was not. Um, I was actually being comfortable being who I am. I know what kind of talent I had. And, you know, I... I was partner at my firm, so it actually bothered some of the other, you know, people that they had to find a way to work with um, female investor. And um, I do um, see some of the statistic I I researched that. It actually is not just my personal thing. Um, when you look at the percentage of the female founders in startups in Korea, and whereas um, uh, the female employees, the founders percentage is 10%, but female employee rates is 24%, which means um, so many of female career women, they don't want to take in charge to start their own business or you know, start you know, um, take challenge to be in front of like people and you know to get invested or um, to um, to challenge themselves. It's just very difficult. And I have some female founders in K startup, and we've been gathering together um, how it is difficult for us to actually make other investor to. Um, to be serious about our business. I mean, some, you know, I don't want to generalize it, but most of times um, 
I think they 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 face the challenge, and it's actually not just um, Korea. I have a lot of female founder group in Silicon Valley that we share all the difficulties um, being an entrepreneur. Um, and one of the biggest thing was actually um, when we do the fundraising, you're basically begging it, right? Begging money. Um, you're the you're in the position that you need help. That some mean, you know, some not very good investor, they take advantage of it, that sometimes it leads to sexual harassment, that I have, I happen to actually, you know, fight for <laughs> my friend one time who asked, you know, um, sexual deal to exchange the money. It actually is happening still. Um, and, and I really think that Women, we have a different talent. Um, we have better empathetic skill. Um, we have, I think, a little bit better than EQ than um, male, right? Um, that it actually helps startups and actually a company to coordinate and um, and grow because, for example, my company, um, we have male and you know um, female, and sometimes we argue, and sometimes I like, um, but we have female like you know employees that like they can talk to the other employee, you know, better that we like we make sure that our missions like we we go for those mission and we don't get sidetracked, you know. Um, And I do think that when you accept the the difference being a woman and when you accept the, a women's talent, actually it helps um, the culture better and every you know aspect of idea. Uh, you cover all this idea of um, you know that you're missing for um, as like logical male thinking that it will lead to the special. Um, special specialty and also to be unique. Um, before I end the presentation and my lecture, um, I think the most important thing is actually knowing who you are and what you want, actually. It all comes from that. The reason I can stand here is because I always had a dream that I want to be global. I may not be the smartest person in the world, right? But I was stick with my own dream that I keep challenging. If I don't know, I just ask and, and finding what I want and achieving one by one. And there are many students here and you probably um, struggle what you're gonna do after school or even if you have a job, Maybe it doesn't suit you that you want to explore the business school. Or you want maybe that's why you're here to listen my story. But listening my story is helpful. But it all should come from your your advice, your thinking first. What do I like? What kind of business do I want to start? You know, what kind of team do I want? Am I able to accept that diversity? If I don't, what should I do? You know, and Ask yourself, keep asking yourself. Then ask other people. Ask other people to get the advice, to get the advice, and bring the advice to yours and make a harmony out of it. Then I'm pretty sure that one day your dream will come true. Thank you so much. Yunjin, thank you for a really great, heartfelt presentation. I appreciate so that much. so much. Uh, I want to start out the questions by asking you, what was the biggest difference between, we'll move over here. What was the biggest difference, be, or, and I'll stand on the other side. You can stay closer to the middle. Um, what was the biggest difference between working with the accelerator and being an entrepreneur yourself? Because you were working with startups. You were helping them get ahead. Yeah, I mean... Until I did the operational side, like I said, 
I had no idea how actually teamwork matters because um, when I was just you know helping entrepreneurs, I'm not. I even though I was like you know hands on helping, I'm not daily involved, right? And, but when I actually um, started my like you know startup, like sometimes okay. For example, I I go to a meeting and I fundraise, and first for the first time I fund fund fundraise for life site. Um, because I'm Miss Korea or because I'm female, they actually ask more technology question uh, than actually Chris. I freaked out. I freaked out. But so what I did was I came to my head engineer and asked him to let you know tutor me. So he gave me tutor about security every week. So everything that I learned from the whole journey of entrepreneurship is actually I can't do it by myself. I need my team member to help me to sell, and my selling will benefit them. So I have to make sure that they go in the right direction and focus. You know, so that was the that was a real experience that I learned as an operational person. Yeah. I yeah. Think okay. So. so if you were to go back and do the accelerator work again, yeah, would you do it different? Hmm. I. Th um. I think that I cannot involve with the company's um, operational side because it's their own team, it's their own family, right? I can advise them, but I think being an advisor too much involved with the company's operational side is also really not good yeah. because it's they actually it's their work and you're you're just a helper and so you have to let them focus and give the help well when they need help, not involve too much, right? Uh, yeah. Because you don't know what's going on daily, right? But, um, but I would actually, you know, uh, be more friendly because entrepreneurship is very, very hard. I mean, I'm dressing up nicely today, but it's really rare, actually. I'm like wearing glasses, wearing backpack every day, going like you know, Mountain View from all the way for San Francisco. I'm sometimes arguing with my co-founder. I yell at him. He yells at me. Like you know, it's just a lot of things happening every day and if you don't believe yourself it's like it's a, it's a big challenge and it's a big commitment it's really not easy it's not glamorous actually every day but it's really fun when you have a right team supporting each other we, you know you you know run for a white goal it's just fascinating so um, i would actually relate to entrepreneur yeah. more when i yeah are there things that silicon valley teams can learn from korea uh, let's see. I think Korean startups or Korean people are very, very fast. Yeah, we we do everything so fast that you know um, our economy mm -hmm. grew like you know in thirty years, yeah. right? So maybe some of the execution side. Um, I think Silicon Valley it's much more contemplating about one decision. You discuss a lot, but sometimes I feel like it's too much. Yeah, so I would Move, actually- go yeah. ahead, do it. Yeah, 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 sometimes, oh, don't talk, just do it. <laughs> so I've got one more question, then we'll open it up to the floor. So, okay, Asia has the reputation for male domination and for women having a hard time, right? Were you surprised when you got to Silicon Valley that Silicon Valley was not more open, or were you surprised that it's as open? How did, how did the Silicon Valley situation for being a woman in a startup, was it a surprise to you here? Um, honestly, no. Okay. <laughs> because one thing I was surprised is actually there is much more movement on female power. So I was invited to speak so many um, women, female mm -hmm. power pro focus conferences, unlike Asia. But I think in terms of daily fundraising or daily life, for example, like a lot of my friends, female friends here, they actually thinking about quitting their startup or they're, they are scared, scared to start their business because they don't know what to do when they give birth. They don't know what to do when, when they start their family. Yeah. And I don't think the regulations or 
uh, the government support is still not there as well here uh -huh. because like I, they like I, I just talked about with my friends that she said I need at least three thousand dollars every month for one nanny if I want to if you want to work that's a lot of money you know yeah. and if and you know kids they need you know attention yeah. love and family support. Um, so and people question women who give their support to other things in addition to their family. Mm -hmm. and it's not like a zero-sum game. Right, right. But yet, sort of there is this expectation. Right, right. So, um, I mean, Zuckerberg, he took like how many months for the, you know, the after the birth. But yeah, yeah. I don't think that it's common, actually. So, okay. yeah, I would actually want, like, you know, <laughs> gentlemen's here to understand how difficult it is sometimes to be a woman to fear all this um, ch challenge, you know? And it's not towards just us. We care about our family. We care about future. And children, you know, is our future, mm -hmm. right? It's like a song. <laughs> so so definitely we, like, like, you know, male, you know, men should care about women's uh, welfare as well you know, for their own family, uh -huh. so. We should hover over you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I get it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Let's open the floor to questions. Go ahead. Hi, Eugen. Yeah. Based on your experience, any advice that you can give on how to effectively sell a foreign market to, Sil to Silicon Valley investors? Mm. I think it's, it's not just Silicon Valley investor, but I would say when I was teaching the pitch, a lot of um, entrepreneur, there's so much going on, right? On and with your, you know, product or even your mission. So if um, I would give an advice that make a very lean and simple presentation and very clear about what you're building and you know what you're, why you're doing this and what's the difference with your company than other competitors out there and what's the business model, you know and how much traction you're in. Like, it's very clear about what you're selling to investor, then you get the attention. That's what I actually experienced. And I, whenever I taught my, you know, Korean startups, they were never educated to summarize or make it simple that I think it was difficult for them to get attention. But once I actually taught them, every time I taught them, I, I was so surprised at how much investor who ignore that portfolio actually look at them. So I would actually uh, encourage you to make a very, you know, logical and very simple um, work um, flow of the presentation. And um, yeah. Thank you. Next question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, going back to your accelerator yes. and incubator days, yes. um, I'm a GSB alum. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of classmates who are from Korea. Okay. So I have a lot of uh, uh, experience with these Korean people, friends of mine. Okay. I mean, these guys are exceptionally bright people. Um, what I realized from them, like you said earlier, is there is a high stigma of failure in Korea. Mm -hmm. And another thing that uh, they brought to my attention is, you know, those corporations you mentioned, LG, Samsung. Right, right, right. They, their revenue is pretty close to 50% of the Korean uh, GDP. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And they told me that pretty close to 700 people apply for every position mm -hmm. in these organizations. Mm -hmm. So what they told me was the stigma of failures prevents people, even very bright people who come to Stanford, mm -hmm. to venture into entrepreneurial opportunities. Mm -hmm. Consequently, also what happens is the employees are not too open to working in all these things. So what happens is you, as an entrepreneur, don't find resources, bright resources, because those resources want oh, to Oh, yeah, that's a good so comment. So as, as an incubator or as an accelerator, what, what is that you can do to, to fight this stigma that exists in the Korean society? I know it's, it's huge, but as an incubator, what can you do? So I actually, it's a really good comment because I was thinking of putting that comment here because a lot of actually uh, startups in Korea, when they start their companies, uh, one of the challenge was actually getting good engineers actually. Like 
engineers, they are just so expensive. And some of the good engineers, they know they're good that they they play games. It's like dating. And um, I don't think it's just um, one person or one company's like you know challenge. It has to come up from the I think government level of solving problems um, like policies. Like um, so. Uh, for example, when government, Korean government, they put lots of money in the, you know, ecosystem of startup. Surprisingly, uh, because of that money, we attract so many good people who studied U.S. or other countries. They come back to Korea, start their own company because they knew that they can get money from um, government or accelerator or VC easily. So, but then, as I mentioned. The, after Series A, there's a missing space for funding or growth or acquisition. So I would say um, the government should have some sort of lower regulation for big companies like NHN or Kakao, like you know, or Samsung to acquire companies. Maybe a little bit, you know, reduce the tax or because I remember one time NHN Naver, which is the it's like a Google in Korea. They said they're not going to acquire any companies when I was running the accelerator, or they're not going to invest in any Korean startup. And I was like, are you serious? Why? And then they said, because of Korean, you know, Korean public, they're going to you know, uh, target us because we're just going to eat up a small company. And also, the government is not you know, helping anything. So I, I do think that it has to come up with like the very high level and changing Maybe tax or those companies to to um, to reduce the regulation to you know have a f very uh, good circulation with um, startup to big company and you the good engineer come out to the startup like you know um, then it may solve the problem. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. Actually, do you mind if I comment a little bit on yeah, this? Yeah. Because this is an area that I think is really critical. The exit is so important. And one reason, you know, would you really want Korean companies buying up startup companies unless they really know how to use the idea? Right. I mean, yeah. because if they buy you to keep you out of the market, that's right. not the good thing, right? Right. But on the other hand, it's really being able to get the benefits of the partnership and the fresh blood and the fresh idea from the startup. And I think that's kind of the next stage in entrepreneurship going international. Mm -hmm. We've had the stage where people are creating. As you see, it's still not enough follow-on funding. Right, right. But to get that follow-on funding, you have to have a goal, right? It has to lead to something. Right, yeah. That's, that's a big challenge. I don't know how long it will going to take, but um, it has to be government, VC, all the ecosystem grow together and keep, keep you know, investing time and money in, in you know, for startup industry, then maybe slowly change. What was it like going from the media business, having your own TV show, <laughs> and suddenly working in, you know, an accelerator? What a different world. I mean, was it a culture shock? Uh, uh, not a culture shock, but it was difficult, uh, obviously, because I was on the spotlight, but when I started Accelerator, literally my startups are the one that who have to get the spotlight, so I have to be the mm -hmm. one that who make them, you know, shine. Um, I struggled in the beginning, um, but I was happy actually. You know, media, like, you know, it's glamorous outside, but it's like I always have to pay attention to my look, and the people sometimes judge me, actually, judge me a lot about what I look like, you know, outside only. But when I went to the actually uh, startup industry, you know, especially early stage, there are so many people who are passionate about what they're building and dream. It was just like me that I I was able to relate to them. You know, so um, I was able to quickly adapt to the culture. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are you going to take life site to Korea? Uh, not right away. Um, okay. Because of all the regulations, actually. That's the thing, uh, Korean government also had to solve. I think um, they're trying to realize that the regulations, for example, active, they're gonna, you know, demolish the ActiveX, mm -hmm. you know, 
uh, like if you are using Mac, you can't open some of the Korean internet because they still run with the ActiveX, you know, with the uh, Explorer that some of the, if you don't have a window that you can't open the websites and stuff. But um, I think new government is now realizing that all those, you know, technology regulations can prohibit other business to come to, you know, Korea that that may be help, but... Um, is it mostly that kind of technology regulation, or is it more things like privacy and what kind of uh, Privacy people? and everything. Bec um, yeah. Like, I think it's a cultural component as well that, like I said, Korean, Korean you know, women... No, the they, reason I say is because yeah. Korean families are big and they're close, right? I mean, you have an extended family. Yeah. And... I would think that there would be some sort of a tiered approach where the people in the real center get access to anything in, mm. you know, kind of a solar system. Yeah, thing. but that's not the issue, actually. The cultural okay. component that I was talking about is more about regulation because yeah. we're dealing with the security, right? And every country has a different security bar and privacy rules that mm -hmm. uh, we do think that um, Korean in China markets are challenging still. Uh, but we are actually already talking with the Japanese government and Indonesian government, okay. which actually uh, they've been through the natural disaster that they want a yeah. product like us. So, um, but actually Samsung, they approached us, um, and some of the like Korean government, they mm -hmm. keep an eye on me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Other questions? Yeah. I, I have a question. Yes. Um, so if you don't have a mechanism for for entrepreneurial companies in Korea, you're saying that you don't, how do the companies innovate? And that seems to be the way that we do it here. Big companies don't have, have a really hard time innovating. Mm -hmm. And they buy smaller companies and that becomes their innovation engine. If you don't have this in Korea, what how how do people innovate? How do the large companies innovate? Um, this is kind of sad to talk. I mean, they do have, you know, Samsung and they have great people have, you know, they have innovation team, right? But sadly, here they acquire those innovative team and they accept the innovation. But a lot of companies like Cheber, like Samsung and LG, they actually don't want to spend money to acquire the idea. So they steal it, they copy and then build their own. And they, so a lot of startups, they have to be careful that big companies, they don't copy because they have better engineering team. They're better resource, right? So... Um, but I do think things are starting to change. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm seeing groups like the Innovation Center, Samsung Innovation Center down in Santa Clara, that are much more outward and openly looking. They've gotten to the stage where they know they need to partner with outside, but it's really hard to convince all the people back home. And so I think that you're seeing movement. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. I mean, Samsung, they want to build something like us. So they, they found me, they approached me. So, and then they have an innovation team and they have venture team keep looking eye on uh, new technology, new startups. Um, but it is actually limited and it's, it's, it's a little bit hard for um, those big company to acquire those team and operate it inside of the hierarchy-based um, company, so. Yeah. So one of the things that I've heard that's been going on in Korea for the last four or five years is that young people, because it's so hard to get a job, are really getting kind of depressed and just feel like the system has passed them by. Mm -hmm. uh, are startups a good way for them to really get into something? Absolutely. I think the 2013, the reason government, they created the future department and all the startup ecosystem movement actually was started from saving all those young, unemployed people. Because the only way they can get job is working for Samsung, working for LG, or going to, you know, um, medical school or being a yeah. lawyer, right? But, uh, so the government thought that if they create job, which they create business, then they can save all those unemployment. So that's why they put a lot of you know budget on the startup ecosystem, and I think it helped. Like literally, Korea is not changing. I see the movement. I see the bright future. 
uh, but it takes time. Like it's a cultural movement, it's a government, and all this team play actually with. So we've yeah. we've just had a change of government in Korea, mm -hmm. right? The previous president has been impeached and right. is now on trial. And just last week there was an election. Right. Do you think the new Korean president is going to basically keep the same sort of approach to entrepreneurship, or do you already see new policies? Um, honestly, I cannot answer correctly. I okay. don't. But it's I. I do. So I chatted with um, partner at Spark Lab, which became number one accelerator in Korea. They're still running very well, uh, and they said that I was worried about. After the the the, the formal government, it's the Skara ecosystem supporting will be gone. But actually, he said that they're passing the accelerator law so that accelerator can have us, you know, claim their fund even the fund size is small. You know, all those like movement is still keep going. That I don't. He said that there's a bright future for Korean startup ecosystem and Korean market is still. Um, not too small, actually, and yeah. and and as long as we keep, you know, changing and challenging and keep working on, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what about startup companies here, Silicon Valley startups? So, if you look back in Asia, you've got China, which is huge. You've got India, which is huge. You've got Indonesia, which is actually a lot bigger than people realize. Right. right. Um, What's special about Korea? What would be good? What would be a good reason for a company to go to Korea? So Korea is a number one fastest mobile penetration market, and Korean people are so tech savvy that if you want to test your product, go to Korea. Especially consumer-based product, go to Korea, whether they like it or not. And Korea is a small country, but we are, you know, open. I mean, we're we're close-minded, but somehow we're, you know, contractually, um, like we're open to, like, accept some of the American culture and create their own in their own country. Uh -huh. It's like, you know, a lot of cafes. If you yeah. look at them, like all the big, tall building, mm -hmm. Gangnam. Also, it's like it's kind of like American, but it's, it's still Actually, Korea, right? It feels a little bit but, like yeah, America. Yeah, it's it like does. a New York, but Gangnam. yeah. So um, it's a good way to test in, like you know, your market, I mean, your business in Korea. And uh, Korean people, I do, I'm very proud of. Like, they're, they're very smart. So um, yeah, I do think, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I guess my last question to you then is really, when you started out with the Miss Korea pageant and all of this, you wanted to tell the world about Korea, right? Yeah, you wanted to let people know about Korea. Yeah. How has that vision changed? Oh, of course, I, I'm still Korea, and I grew up with military family. I grew up in DMZ area looking at North Korean all the time, even now, and I'm a very, I think, um, patriot person. Uh -huh. Even though I love America, I, I see the potentials and I love the diversity. Um, but I do, you know, I do think that Korea is a, is a small country, but um, we have Samsung and we have LG. It's like, you know, it's a tiny country, but people know what we are famous for. And I hope I am one of a value that people, when they meet me, they know about and they learn about Korea a little bit more, good and, and bad. So maybe it won't be too long before people know about LifeSite. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yunjin. This awesome. was great today.